I'm going to share with you some of my epoxy tips, some of the things that I do that you might find useful. And I'm also going to show you a method for mixing up a small batch of epoxy. It's almost always recommended to mix epoxy in a large batch for your rod building finish. But I'm going to show you how you can mix one to one epoxy and get good results with it. It'll set up like it's supposed to, but you got to follow this technique in order to get it to do so. I've tried measuring it out, weighing it out. It doesn't work as well that way when it comes to mixing up a small size batch. The way I'm going to show you works pretty well and it's really easy to do and I've never had a problem with it not setting up. And as you'll see here in just a second, it sets up hard as a rock just like it's supposed to. I'm using a old guide on a broken rod just for demonstration purposes and I chose to use metallic thread for the wrap because I thought it might catch more light and be somewhat reflective and maybe help show any imperfections because I wanted you to be able to clearly see there's no bubbles in this finish and the way that I get the bubbles out is very easy. I'm not adding a lot of heat or anything to it in order to get those bubbles to release. Here are some things that you're going to want to keep in mind anytime you're working with epoxy. First and foremost, you need to be aware of your environment that you're working in. I always work indoors in a climate controlled area, so the humidity is somewhat in check and the temperature is always right around 70, 71 degrees. Anytime you have higher temperatures, lower temperatures, different humidity levels. It changes the whole dynamics of the way the epoxy works, how it sets up, changes. I'm gonna recommend if you can to do your work in a climate controlled area where you've got the temperature somewhere around 70 degrees room temperature. You should be fine anywhere from the high 60s on up to around 75 degrees before anything makes any major changes. The warmer your environment, the easier the epoxy flows, that changes things. The more humidity changes how fast it sets up. There's a lot of variables. Temperature controls how fast it sets up. The more you can keep your variables constant, the more consistent results you're going to have. So that's the first thing you really need to be aware of. The next most important thing is getting your mixture right on your epoxy and how you mix it. Most rod finish epoxy is going to mix in a one-to-one -one by volume ratio. What that means is volume, the area that the epoxy takes up, needs to be the same from parts A and parts B. This is not by weight. Some epoxies are done by weight. All the rod building finish I've run across is done by volume. It's two different things and you need to be aware of that. You don't want to weigh these out. You want to measure them by volume. A lot of people, myself included, use measuring cups that have markings on them. You'll want to make sure to use measuring cups that do not have silicone added to them. Any surface silicone will cause finish problems that could be in the cups. And you can get these measuring cups from a lot of different rod building supply houses. And they're very handy if you're mixing up a large batch of epoxy. In this video, I'm not going to be mixing up a large batch. I'm going to be doing it a different way. I'm going to show you how to do that. But ordinarily, if you're doing several guides, you'd want to mix up a large batch. And these cups are real handy for that. And you also need to mix these two parts very thoroughly. And what you'll notice is that both your parts A and B are fairly transparent when you pour them into your measuring cup or whatever you're using. As you start to mix them together, they will look cloudy together. There'll be almost a haziness inside the liquid. You need to mix the liquid thoroughly, scraping it from the sides, from the bottom, all around to get everything together thoroughly. And as you continue mixing, that cloudiness will start to go away and the whole mixture then will look transparent again. That's what you're looking for. That's when you know you've mixed them properly. Now here's a tip for you that you might not be aware of. Your epoxy is gonna have a part A and a part B. Ordinarily, the part A is the resin and the part B is the hardener. In my personal experience, the resin's always thicker than the hardener. When it comes to measuring these out by volume, that's gonna make a difference. And I'm show you the correct order to do that in order to alleviate some measuring problems that you might encounter. Because the hardener is thinner, I always pour it into my cup first because it will self-level really quickly because it's less viscous than the resin is. If you pour the resin first, it will tend to dome up towards the center and the outside is where you're actually seeing where your volume measurement is on your cup. 
because the side closest to the outside, if you pour the resin first, would show lower than the actual amount, it's going to want to dome up in the middle a little bit. That's going to throw your volume measurement off just a hair. And it could be the difference between getting an epoxy that sets up and one that doesn't mix together. So what I recommend doing would be to put the hardener in first because it's less viscous. It's going to level itself out quicker. Then when you pour in your resin into that hardener, it's going to go to the bottom and tend to do its thing where it domes up somewhat, but it's not going to matter because your hardener is going to move up to the level that you're trying to reach. So just say you're mixing three cc's of each part A and part B together. If you put your hardener in first, you've got three cc's of the hardener in there. As you add the resin to that, the level of the hardener is going to come up and it's still fairly flat. So that doming effect of the resin is not going to matter. And I hope that makes sense to you. If I'm mixing a large batch after I get it all mixed together and it goes from cloudy back to clear, I like to pour that out onto aluminum foil, which does a couple of things. First off, it makes for a thinner layer of epoxy so the bubbles can release more readily and come to the top. They've got less distance to travel. And that will get rid of some of the mixing bubbles. And I don't use anything fancy. I don't use an epoxy mixer or anything like that. I mix it all by hand. A lot of times I use stir sticks like you'd use for coffee. Nothing fancy at all about the way I do it. But if you spread the epoxy out onto some aluminum foil, it can spread out some, make that layer thinner. The bubbles have less distance to travel. Just let it sit there for a minute or two to kind of release some of those bubbles. The aluminum foil also helps dissipate some of the heat that's generated by the chemical reaction, which slows down the setting up of the epoxy. I promised to show you how you can mix up a small batch. I'm going to do that by counting drops. This is actually an old way of doing it that I discovered reading through some stuff a while back and I cannot find where I found that now. Apparently it's kind of the old way of doing things and what they would do is just count drops of epoxy. Three drops of one to three drops of another, mix the two together and your volume should be correct. I found in experimenting with that method, the easiest way to do that is without heating the epoxy. If you heat it, it comes out way too fast. So again, we're just at room temperature here. It's inside my house, it's probably 70, 71 degrees, somewhere around in there. So the epoxy is not gonna just run out of the end of the nozzle here. Another thing to note, is that these cone shaped nozzles on the flex coat that I'm using the ultra V or ultra five. I think it's ultra V for the ultraviolet protection. It has extra additives for that, but those cone shaped nozzles, the way they come, there's no opening on the end of them. So in order to keep my opening consistent between the two bottles, I drill those out. I believe the drill bit I used to drill a hole in the end of each of these was somewhere around an eighth of an inch. Might have been just a little under that. But the main idea is you want your hole diameters to be small and you want them to be consistent between the two bottles and using a drill bit to make your holes in the end of these nozzles is a good way to keep the hole size the same between the two. I don't squeeze the bottles much, maybe just a little bit just to get it to come out some, but I just pretty much let it just fall out and I count my drops. And on this wrap, it's a relatively short wrap, the total length from end to end on epoxy ended up being somewhere around an inch. The wrap itself is somewhere around three quarters of an inch, so it's a small wrap. I used three drops of each, part A and part B, for the first coat of epoxy. I did not record it, but I mixed up a second batch for the second coat using the same three drops of each. But I'm going to mix it the same way. I'm just going to stir it until it goes clear. Again, it's pretty clear at first. Then you mix them together, it turns hazy, and then you continue mixing until it turns clear again. And since I just dropped them on aluminum foil, there's no place for the different parts to hide in any nooks or crannies. So it's real easy to mix them all together thoroughly and combine the two parts equally. And again, I, I did not invent this. I was a little leery of it at first when I read about it, but I'll try anything once. So I gave it a shot and it worked just fine. I've been using that a lot since then. I use it for a lot of things that I do, especially on my YouTube channel where I'm just doing a demonstration of something. I don't want to mix up a whole batch of epoxy. I'll do the drop method and it works great. I also use it a lot if I'm just replacing a guide on a rod. If I'm not doing a, a full build or something like that, I don't need a lot of epoxy. I'll do the drop method. I I have never had it not set up on me. I'm going to recommend that it, you try it and you try it on something that's not important, maybe a broken rod.
rod, take a guide off, put one back on, something along those lines. Give it a shot, let it dry for about 24 hours, check it. I've never had a problem with it. As always, I'd recommend anybody try it for themselves first. Don't go out and just start building a whole rod without at least trying it first. But I do this with the flex coat and I also do this on regular epoxy that I use around the house or on real seats or things like that. If I don't need much epoxy mixed up, I use the drop method. It works every time on any of the one-to-one -one ratio epoxies I've tried it with. Never had any problems whatsoever with it. Now I'm just going to use a spatula of sorts. It's a tool that I use a lot for doing wraps and also use it for applying epoxy sometimes. I'm using that because it's really easy to scrape it off of the aluminum foil since I've got such a small amount here. I'm just going to gather it up using the tool and use that to apply it to the wrap itself. I think it's always a good idea to start at the foot of your guide and work it up the sides where there's usually a little bit of a gap between the thread, the foot, and the rod blank. A lot of people call that the tunnel. If you'll work the epoxy around that tunnel area, it will go through the threads down and make a bond between all three parts there, the thread, the rod, and the guide foot. And it'll also help prevent bubbles from coming up from that tunnel into your epoxy as it's starting to set up. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to do two layers here. I'm going to get the first layer on and it's going to be really thin and it's going to go down into the tunnels and I'm going to leave it on the rod while I mix up another batch. And I'm not waiting for one to dry before I go to the second one. The first one I just want to soak in everywhere it's going to soak in. That way if there's going to be any low spots, the second coat will fill all that in and it'll all bond together as one part. I'm just going to work that epoxy around, let it do its thing. I'm not going to push it into the threads. At room temperature, the epoxy's thin enough, it's going to go where it needs to go if you got down into colder temperatures it's not going to flow as well you might need to heat it up again i wouldn't recommend heating it and using the method i'm using here if you're going to do that do it in a big batch i try to do everything at room temperature in my house it's consistent so i always get the same results because of that i'm not overworking the epoxy i'm just spreading it out and it will start to level itself when I put it on the rod turner to let it spin at a slow RPM. But this first coat I'm putting on by hand, the second coat I'm actually gonna use a motor and it's a 200 RPM gear motor. I've shown that on my channel. I sell the stands that I use also. I'm using that 200 RPM motor to put the second coat of epoxy on, which I'll get to here in just a minute. Now, off camera, I've mixed up a second batch of three drops a piece of part A and part B. I'm using the 200 RPM motor now to spin the rod. And to me, the easiest way to get clean ends and crisp lines on your ends is to use a motor. It's not the only way, but to me, it's the easiest way. And I've shown in another video, and I'll put a link up here in the top right hand corner, how you can do all this without any kind of motorized apparatus, even a dryer motor. But if you have two motors, one a high speed and one a low speed, I personally use a 200 RPM motor for doing epoxy work and a 10 RPM motor for doing the drying. If you have those, they're really helpful and they'll really help you get things done more efficiently. Again, this is not the only way to do it. I'm just showing you the way I'm doing it. In this video, I've got other videos that show different ways of doing it. But to me, this is the easiest way to do it and get good clean lines, very few bubbles if any, and the bubbles are gonna be easy to get out as I'll show you here in a minute. The way I get the nice looking ends, especially on the front side, I mostly just push the epoxy towards the front and let it form a little ridge there. And as it begins to level out, it will kind of roll itself out into a clean line on the front end. The back end is a little trickier. I'm using a slip clutch chuck here that's made out of a baby bottle like I've shown in another video. I'll put a link to that up in the top right hand corner of this one if you want to check that out. So I can stop this motor from spinning just by grabbing the rod with my fingers and I'm going to kind of just put a little extra epoxy up at the top of the guide foot. This is a single foot guide and where the frame wise out I put a little extra epoxy right there and then I try to work it a little bit by hand around the sides. It's always easier for me to get the front edge clean. The back edge is a little different. You gotta work work it by hand a little bit more. And I also will show you how I clean it up a little bit on the back side 
Now I'm just going to let it spin for a few seconds and then I'm going to stop it again and take another look at it around that back edge. And when I did, I noticed that there was a little bit of epoxy that could have been moved towards the back side a little bit to help it roll around. So I just pushed the epoxy down towards that end a little bit, try to get a little build up on the bottom side. That way when I turn the motor back on, it can spin around and start to go around the circumference of the rod on its own. And that's pretty much all I do just to get the epoxy onto the wrap itself. There's a little bit of cleanup we'll do here and then it will go on the slow turning motor for some drying and I'll look for bubbles when I put it on the dryer motor and try to get those straightened out before they set in place. Now to clean up this back side, I have stopped the motor from turning and I'm going to use a piece of folded up coffee filter. Don't use a tour or cut end of a coffee filter. If you're using coffee filters, those areas tend to come apart or unravel a little bit. So fold the piece that you're using up to where you're using a folded edge and then wrap the coffee filter around the rod and less is more here. You just want to kind of tighten up the end just a little bit kind of square it up just a bit by wrapping it around the rod and rotate the rod and then you're going to want to get it on the dryer so that it can level itself out on that back end and the whole wrap in general. I was shooting for a really flat finish on this guide and that's because that's my personal preference. I don't like big globs of epoxy on my guides. I like to keep it minimal. Almost all your holding strength on your guide is in the thread itself. The epoxy is there to protect that thread and to keep it from moving around. So to me, if you're adding too much epoxy, you're adding weight and it's really not doing a whole lot. Just as far as appearances go, I prefer a flat finish. So what I'm doing here is I'm stopping the rod and I'm going to let it set for just a few seconds, enough to where some of the epoxy starts to pull up on the bottom. And I'm just going to take a piece of folded up coffee filter again and use the absorbency of that coffee filter to help pull some of that epoxy off of the wrap. That's going to cut down on how much epoxy is left on your wrap and will help make the whole wrap, in my opinion, look nicer and it'll have a nice flat finish as you'll see when we get done to me this is the biggest difference between a rod you buy in the store and one that's being hand built custom made by somebody it's the extra things it's the small things the extra things the little extra time to do this or that that really add up to big differences now I've just put the rod on the dryer. There started to be some bubbles forming. It wasn't major. There was a few here and there. A lot of people will use different heat sources and a lot of those heat sources are also a good way to cook your finish. And if you cook your finish, if you thought you had bubbles before, you'll really have some bubbles if you get your finish too hot. It will basically boil the epoxy. There will be thousands of bubbles in it and there's nothing you can do at that point. You've already ruined it. So I'm gonna show you a way to add a little heat, enough to pop the bubbles usually, and it's real simple. Now I have used alcohol burners and a lot of other things, but this way is really easy and I actually like it quite a bit. If you just take an ordinary drinking straw and blow very lightly on the wrap through that straw, the air that comes out of your lungs is fairly warm because it's been in your body and it's quite a bit warmer than room temperature. And it's usually enough heat to get bubbles to pop, especially when you put a finish on as thin as this one is. And I'm just using a very gentle breath. I'm not blowing hard. You'll see that the epoxy is not moving around. If you're blowing too hard, it'll push the epoxy around. You don't want to do that. You just want to get some of that heat from the air in your lungs onto the epoxy in order to help pop those bubbles a little quicker. And alcohol burners work fine. I use those sometimes. But if I've got very minor bubbles and I'm doing a thin finish, to me it's just as easy to grab a straw and blow a little hot air on it, pop them, and, and you're done. The biggest thing is just finding what works for you. When you find what works for you, stick with it. You know it's going to do what you want it to do every time. Finding that consistency is a key. Knowing different ways of getting to that point is helpful. And I use different techniques at different times depending on what I'm doing. And that's it. You're just going to let it turn on your rod dryer now until it's set up. Try to resist the temptation to do anything to it after that point. You'll usually end up making things worse if you do, or at least that's my own experience. 
If you need to correct any little flaws or anything, once everything's set, you can do that. And it's better to do it when it's dry than when it's wet. If it's wet, you're going to move things around and it's just going to make a mess. Once it's dry, if you need to wet sand or, or remove any little debris that might have gotten in it, that would be the better time to do that and just put a very light coat back over the top of it and let it dry again. So I hope you found some useful tips in this. I know the video was long. I tried to leave tips throughout it. So hopefully it kept you watching without being too boring. And if anybody has any questions or needs any clarification or anything like that, just leave a comment below and I'll see if I can help. But that's all I've got for now. I hope y'all have a good day and I'll talk to y'all later.